Welcome to the integumentary system. I'm going to give you about 14 minutes worth of notes on the integumentary system. We'll discuss them in class. Remember, this is not the end all to be all for notes. So bring your questions to class, bring your CLA packets, bring your brains, get ready to iron out the wrinkles, and step it up a notch. All right. Can anyone tell me what this is a picture of? Right. You got it. It is stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Nice thing about it is. You can see the stratum basale, the base of it, where it's being fed by the blood vessels, comes up to where it flattens out for all that nice dead stuff you see at the very top of your skin. And this stuff down here, connective tissue, very good. You are so smart. All right, this is last year's averages. You can do much better on your tissues test, I hope. Oh, look at there. Dr. Helms with a bunch of Oompa Loompas. Yes, your integumentary system. Sometimes it can turn orange, you're going to find out why. What does integument mean? <laughs> Something that covers or encloses, and your integumentary system does just that. It is made up of both the epithelial tissue as well as connective tissue, blood tissue, nervous tissue. Your skin is the largest organ of the human body. Not internal organ, but organ overall. What are some functions of the integumentary system? Know these, be able to understand these. They're pretty simple. The very first and primary function is that of protection. It prevents us from dehydrating. That's why you've got your scaled layers up there. It's our first line of defense against the bacteria. Remember the little bacteria think they're getting in and they take that magic carpet ride on your skin that flakes off and becomes dust in your room. Ultraviolet radiation penetrates only so far, just enough to do good for vitamin D protection, but not enough to really damage the rest of us, thank goodness. And against physical attack, if you get scraped or scratched, you don't totally bleed because you've got a bunch of dead stratified squamous epithelia up there. Ooh, sensation. You can feel hot, cold, light, deep, a constant pressure. You can feel the slight movement of your hair follicles. But you can't feel spicy. Actually, you can feel spicy. Spicy is pain. So you can, you've got hot and cold nerves, which are separate, but they're so close to each other, you can't really tell the separation unless you're using a very fine pin. Hmm, how does the sun and this cholesterol become a pre vitamin D3? And then a vitamin D3 in the skin. Oh, the skin, another function, yes. It's a precursor to vitamin D production. It starts in the skin with the ultraviolet radiation from the sun changing it. And then it proceeds on the liver and kidney to make the final vitamin D product. As you can see, the ultraviolet, the B ultraviolet rays change the cholesterol in the skin, which then gets further modified in the liver, which then gets further modified by the kidney to make vitamin D, which in the intestines and the bones increases calcium absorption and phosphorus absorption so that we can actually absorb the calcium. That's why they modify cow's milk. They put vitamin D in so we can actually absorb the calcium because we're more of an indoor society and we don't get out as much as we need to to get the necessary vitamin D from the sun. Again, some more functions. Temperature regulation. We've discussed this already, but to remind you, your capillaries, your superficial capillaries, are surrounded by smooth muscles. Okay, they constrict when it's cold outside to keep the heat in. When you're hot and your face gets all red, it's because these muscles are relaxing, allowing the blood flow to flow close to the surface and release a lot of that heat. Hair follicles. Your hair follicle here is raised by this little muscle right here, which gives you goosebumps, this little erector pili. When the hair shoots up, it blocks the wind from ripping the heat off your skin, cuts down that wind, taking the heat away and lets you stay warmer. And sweat glands, this guy here and this guy here, they produce sweat. Some go straight to the skin, some drop off into the hair follicle, which we'll discuss later. Sweat. Sweat also has a very minute amount of uric acid, urea, ammonia, and some other waste products, but it's mainly water. 
So is it a great waste product delivery system? No, but it does get rid of some waste products. So when they say you're sweating the poison out of you, to an extent you are. But the main reason for sweating is to cool us down because sweating puts fluid on the surface and evaporation is a cooling process. Okay, the three main layers of the skin. There's your epidermis, epi, upon, dermis, the dermis. Your dermis, which is made mainly of connective tissue, you've got the loose connective tissue, you've got your blood, you've got your nervous tissue in there as well. And you've got some glands where the epidermis dips deep into the dermis to make the hair follicles and the sweat glands. And you have your hypodermis, hypo under dermis, under the dermis, which again has a lot of blood vessels, some nerves, as well as a lot of fat. 50% of your body fat is stored in your skin, in the hypodermis. All right, the subcutaneous layer, or hypodermis, term we use most in the medical field for sub, for hypodermis is subcutaneous layer. So if they're giving you a shot sub-Q, they're sticking it under your skin. The needle goes through the epidermis, through the dermis, and into the hypodermis, or below it, and it shoots in that subcutaneous layer. It is made mainly of loose connective tissue. Like I said earlier, it contains about half your body fat, give or take. There's a lot of blood vessels and nerves. It's very vascularized. Blood vessels means vascularized. It is the thickest layer of the skin, yet it's missing on part, such parts as the eyelids and your lips. Here's a nice little diagram showing again the epidermis is made mostly of your stratified squamous epithelial tissue, which happens to drop deep down here into the dermis at the hair follicles. The dermis, which is mostly loose connected areolar tissue, along with your hair follicles, your sebaceous glands, and your sweat glands. And then your hypodermis or subcutaneous layer contains some nerves, blood vessels, but mostly adipose tissue, fat. Boom, there you go, dermis tissue, dense connective tissue, some adipose, collagen elastic fibers for stretchability, macrophages, which leave the blood system to go to fight infections, small capillaries, nerve endings, smooth muscles, hair follicles, sweat glands, and sebaceous glands, which produce sebum, and the reason for that is to coat your skin to keep it from drying out. Makes it nice and moist, but when you wash your hands so much and wash yourself a lot, you wash that off, you tend to get dry and flaky. That's why you put lotion on. And lymph vessels. Alright, again, your dermis is the main part which becomes leather when they tan a cow. Cows hide the dermis with all its strong collagen and elastic fibers. Makes a great leather outer wear for like boots and stuff. Dermal papillae. Hey, your dermal papillae. They're little bumps all from the dermis extending up into the epidermis. If you look down here, you see these bumps of this connective tissue bumping up, bumping up into your epidermis here. And those, when you look pull way back from the outside, you see what they leave. They leave a fingerprint. They contain blood vessels and they supply the blood and fluids necessary up to the epidermis. You're finally on top, you see the epidermis. This one happens to be sweaty. Oh look, there's the remnants of your little cord that hooked to your mama years ago. Your belly button. It is made mainly of stratified squamous epithelium. It is undergoing mitosis at the stratum basale, or the base layer. Stratum means layer, basale means base. Constant mitosis, you're constantly regenerating your skin. As you get older, well, everything goes downhill. The skin gets thinner, get more wrinkles, lose the collagen the more UV rays you hit. So it undergoes regeneration. You're constantly regenerating the same type of cells. It is keratinized. That means that outer layer is full of keratin protein. By the time it gets up there, 
Again, it's full of protein, keratin protein, the same thing as your fingernails and your hair, interlocked to make a nice tight bond from the outside. That outside is called stratum corneum. Literally means layer of horns or horny layer because the bull's horns are made of the exact same keratin protein that our fingernails and our stratum corneum are. It has melanocytes down in the very base layer, the stratum basale. Melanocytes literally mean melanin containing cells, cells which have the pigment to them. Again, here's the layers of the epidermis as seen here in the stratified squamous epithelial, which are going to be labeled on the next one. So, connective tissue down here. Here's your base layer. There's a dermal papillae there. Up here where it gets really flat, that's your stratum corneum. Kind of hard to see on this one, so we slide to a nicely labeled thing, which makes it easier for us to see. Stratum corneum, got an asterisk next to it. You need to know that. Stratum lucidum, it's lucid. Stratum granulosum, it's more granulous. Stratum spinosum, kind of spiny. I'm not going to hold you accountable to knowing those. Stratum basale, yes, the base layer, the one constantly undergoing mitosis. You need to know that. Guess what just happened here? I love these new computers. Ah, melanocytes. You know what? The difference between the African descent, the Asian descent, and the European descent people? It's just the melanocytes. The numbers of melanocytes. You hear all these fallacies out there about someone can jump higher, or someone can see better, someone's smarter because of this. That's just a cultural thing. It's mainly this thing here called a melanocyte. And in African people, because they descended from Africa, which they have a lot more sun time throughout the years, those with a darker skin out in the sun got less skin cancer. They survived. The Asian culture, they had a lot more of the melanocytes putting off more of the yellow pigment. And the Europeans, they're a little more pasty for the average, unless you're in Italy. So if you're Scottish or Irish, yeah, stay out of the sun. You're probably not full of too many melanocytes. The melanin is dispersed by things called melanosomes. So it's not the number of melanocytes, but the activity of each. Each one of them. We all have melanosomes, melanocytes, but some are more active than others. What else can change the skin color other than melanocytes? Well, if you take a look at the picture in the top right, when you get very angry, you tend to release some chemical compounds, which get you hot and ready for the fight and the flight or fight response. Hormones can also produce increased melanin production, the mask of pregnancy in pregnant women. There we go. Anger, blushing, inflammation, causing a blood vessel to dilate, increasing redness of the skin. That's the lady in the top right hand corner. Notice the hand down below. It's orangey compared to a normal hand. This person is one who eats a whole lot of carrots or sweet potatoes. The plant pigment, the beta carotene, is lipid soluble. Remember, your cells have a bilipid membrane. So that pigment is absorbed into the skin. And when you eat a lot, it can change your dermis orangish yellow. So save the money tanning. Eat a bunch of carrots this winter. There's the mask of pregnancy on the left. When she's pregnant, her hormones cause this little blotchy dark appearance. Even though she has makeup on right over here, she still doesn't have that blotchy appearance. Kind of looks like they tried to cover it by makeup, but I really don't think they did. I think it's just the mask of pregnancy is more visible when she's pregnant. Like that. Nice close-up of it. Alright. Blue coloring is due to low oxygen. When your blood is lowly oxygenated, it turns more of a purple than a bright red. Through our collagen fibers in the dermis, the blood appears to be blue. It's really not blue. It just appears to be that color. So they call it cyanosis because cyan is a blue color. So if you happen to get be low blood for one reason or another, and you start getting that blue coloring, they say you're cyanotic. Okay, the veins and other pigments deep in the dermis and hypodermis appear blue due to the collagen diffracting the light. Like I said, the collagen fibers through your dermis, they diffract the light, just like the sky is 
That was my chicken. Just like the sky is.